You're listening to Nurture Your Zest. I'm your host, Ashley King, and I will introduce you to a wealth of interesting, fascinating individuals from all walks of life who will share their stories, how they've overcome challenges, and you will find out their top tips for success. Through this podcast, you can gain tips to grow and change your life and the way you see the world and help you to nurture your zest. Hello and welcome to Nurture Your Zest. I'm delighted to be joined by Jody Hill today. So I was very fortunate to see you recently speak um, on a panel for International Women's Day in Leeds. And I was so inspired just by your story and your energy and personality. So I'm so excited Thank to you. have Thank you, you here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Um, so Jodie, can you share a little bit about um, who you are and what led to you being on that International Women's Day panel? Yeah, of course. So um, traditionally, actually, I trained as a barrister. Um, I now am the CEO of a lo- my own law firm, which I set up four years ago called Thrive Law. So we specialise in employment law, diversity, inclusion and well-being. So quite a unique uh, offering. And we've got a team all over the UK from Devon all the way up to um, well I'm currently in Newcastle (laughs) working remotely and we just do loads of work on um, I suppose diversity inclusion empowering women and that's really how I then got into the women empowerment panel Um, I do loads of work in that space um, all across the UK actually and do lots of public speaking as well so it's really exciting actually following your journey because as you said you've only had your own law firm uh, you know you're very experienced and you've worked on so many projects but your your firm's been running for four years yeah. yet it's had explosive growth mm. and you've got a brilliant team yeah. and you know a very supportive team uh, you are being nominated for awards uh, we were both <laughs> at the northern power that, women yes. awards yeah. so can you share a little bit about that growth journey yeah for- Yeah, of course. Well, really, I mean, it started just me on my own. So I'm the only director and shareholder. And the idea was to us to create an environment that was really inclusive. People could show up as their true self, uh, which is quite unique in the legal sector because very traditional. Um, You know, you don't can't wear pink hats and (laughs) and like bright green shoes. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so so really how it all came about was for me to attract people who shared those values and could help me grow it. And I've actually n- not even used a recruiter. People have just from social media um, and through like public speaking, things like that. And actually one of my staff joined me um, because she saw me on the, uh, mum saw me on the news. And um, I was talking quite openly about the fact I'd had PTSD and I set my firm up because I had a mental breakdown for five years ago, I think. And I decided I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to work in that kind of environment anymore. And I talked quite publicly about that at the time. And um, yeah, one of my team joined me and she left a massive firm in London and uh, moved to Leeds to to work with me. And she was one of my, uh, in fact, she's actually been with me three years today, which is really exciting. What's their name? Uh, Alicia Collinson. She's currently on um, maternity leave at the moment, having her first baby. Oh, so, how exciting! Yeah. So, you're, not only have you grown and your th- uh, firm, we has have grown. tried babies. <laughs> yeah, we have two people on maternity leave at the minute. Oh, actually, amazing! That's wonderful, and uh, congratulations and happy an- work anniversary to her to for, this, for yeah. finding you. Wow, um, I think it's really uh, brave that you've had a lot of those um, opportunities. Well, use your voice, mm. you know, to help others. It takes a lot of courage. It's one of the things that I resonated with you as well because I have PTSD and ADHD, yeah, which I know we, we both, both do. <laughs> um, but also, what attracted me to you in the room that I, I was fortunate to see you speak at was just your your colours. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something I do want to ask about. You know, so in law, mm-hmm. before you started your own firm, yeah. what was your day to day like? I mean. Did you ever feel excluded? Did you feel the sense of not fitting in? Mm. What was it like for you uh, before as a barrister? Yeah, I definitely felt like that. I always felt like I didn't fit, especially at school, actually. Um, And I just thought I was a bit weird. Well, I am a bit weird, and that's fine. (laughs) But I accept that that's fine now. And I think everybody, especially when you're younger, you do try to fit and be like everybody else. Um, And I think now I kind of just embrace who I am and and I get that sometimes people won't like that, but that's also okay. Um, but yeah, definitely had that um, growing up, but also in business. 
And when I first set the firm up, um, you know, I was 29. I was one of the youngest law firm owners in the UK. And I was a woman. And, you know, well, still I'm a woman. Uh, <laughs> but, but the reality is most law firm owners are men. Uh, there's only 5% are women. So, again, really challenging with a mental health condition. It, undiagnosed ADHD at the time, because I was only diagnosed in 2020, similar to you. Yeah. And you know, those challenges, it's kind of like navigating that is really difficult because you, d- you just don't know what's happening. So I think now I've had that diagnosis, for me, it's been a bit of a relief because I understand a little bit more about myself and I feel much more self-aware in order to communicate in a way that makes me feel comfortable, but also to explain to other people like why I am the way I am. And it's not that I'm rude and it's not that, you know, I, I think sometimes it can be misconstrued the way that i process things or the way that I communicate and I don't don't know about you but I always interrupt people and I'm so impatient Um, I can feel myself twitching ready to just say something and you know it's it's through excitement it's through the energy that's in me but that can come across as a bit um, you know rude if it's in a conversation with lots of people or you know if it's with one of my team or a client it's like trying to teach myself almost sit on my hands and go right be patient (laughs) I totally get that and I think we definitely should talk about ADHD because it's such a a misunderstood Mm. um, diagnosis Mm. I think or just a a Especially for women as well. Absolutely Um, but one of the things before we talk about ADHD that I was thinking about is just it can be so frustrating in a meeting when you feel like you know not necessarily know the answer but you can see people glossing over a problem and not speaking the truth Mm. or not saying what they really think or mean or feel Mm. and um and sometimes we have to do that in corporate life we Mm. have to infer things but I think one of the things that I've learned about neurodivergence is actually where possible being as frank and open Mm. as you can can really help save yeah. a lot of time and stress in business. And I think as well, um, I, I'm certainly very direct. And that's that I think is a benefit. Um, at least you know where you stand with me. <laughs> and I think that's quite common with neurodivergence. There's that often we'll say things that other people are going, oh, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> but actually, it's, it's, it's yeah, you know where you stand and it's the reality. And you can get through things much quicker and we just see things differently. Yeah. Um, which I think to neurotypical people sounds like, oh have you got some superpowers well it it can be really beneficial um but obviously it's not without its its negatives as well so it's kind of balancing that and and I suppose learning to live with that in a way that's positive rather than focusing on all the negatives focusing on on how you can kind of cope I think that's important um so I mean with, with ADHD you know I know when I was diagnosed I went through a massive breakdown I Mm. was really lost and just feeling like I just didn't fit in I just couldn't find my path Mm. but also I'd filled my life so busy that there was no possible space for me to have (laughs) any opportunity to even rest or think and then the pandemic happened and you weren't surrounded by five networking events a day or 400 people or whatever and I want to ask what well, I guess I wanted to hear your thoughts and perspective mm-hmm. on, you know, women are less diagnosed mm-hmm. um, than than our male counterparts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm just curious, is there anything for you where you just like, when you had your diagnosis, you were like, whoa, that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. for me, it was the hyperactivity analysis. I never thought you could be hyperactive if it was in your mind Mm. but the raising thoughts the lack of sleep the constant needing to be on projects and so busy or even watching a film and playing on my ipad or or whatever not being able to just do one task at a time i don't remember the last time i did that yeah (laughs) medication does help which we can talk about later but yeah i think it was a massive I, I, well, I'm, I'm hyperactive, I'm very fidgety, and people actually used to call me ADHD when I was a kid. So the signs were there. I'm not really sure why I was never, um, never diagnosed earlier, but I think because I was a high achiever and because I had um, been treated for anxiety and PTSD, the symptoms are actually very similar. And what my diagnosis showed was that my ADHD had been a contributing factor to the symptoms of my anxiety, actually, because of I was getting super frustrated and feeling like a failure and all of those, uh, you know, uh, I suppose, intrusive thoughts that come in. That was making my mental health worse and I hadn't realized and part of that diagnosis like the report I actually read the report the other day um, and I haven't read it since um, since I was diagnosed in July 2020 and I was reading through it and I was like oh yeah 
that all makes sense and it I think it's it's important to for like that the, one of the reasons I wanted to reread it was it is obviously uh, neurodiversity week when we're recording and I wanted to do a post about my symptoms because everybody's symptoms are different and you've mentioned hyperactivity I'm I'm com- combined so I've got the inattentive symptoms as well um so for people that don't know there's two types of ADHD you can have just hyperactivity or you can have just inattentive or you can have combined um and the diagnosis basically explains what type of ADHD that you might have and I think it's really interesting because some people don't realize you can have it without the hyperactivity as well so the awareness around like what does that mean and hyperactivity isn't just like being naughty boys at school and I think women certainly manifest um, their behaviors in in a different way when they have ADHD and I'm very similar to you in that I I'm very high energy um, and I actually just want to be doing stuff all the time I mean my diary is like fully booked till that tune. So it was really good that I could come up actually and do this because um, I ended up coming up here and, you know, just having a, a couple of days where I was like, no, I've got not going to have any meetings and just try and get some work done. But literally even evenings and weekends, I'm always planning stuff. Um, but the pandemic was great for just slowing me down. I had no choice. I had to. Um, and that gave me the self-awareness to go get the diagnosis I think that was the point where I was going there's still something not right here Um, my anxiety is under control I'm not taking medication for that but there's something else and I just couldn't work out what the something else was Um, so I I went private for a diagnosis because the the waiting list is ridiculously long Um, and the process I thought was was quite um it's quite intense actually um quite intrusive as well you know getting your family members and your friends to fill forms about your behavior and your childhood out I think you know, quite a lot goes into that process which I don't think people realize it's not like when you go to your GP and say oh I think you've got anxiety have some tablets it's much more complicated than that which I think is why there's such a big wait for the, you know it takes a long time to to get to that point but I think for me it was such a relief because it it made me it, I had a lot of aha moments and it made me realise that actually there were loads of things that were unexplained before and I have an explanation now so it's a little bit easier to I suppose function on some of the areas that I wasn't functioning so well on. It's so interesting hearing you talk because it's like looking in a mirror <laughs> and um, I'm combined as well yeah. and one of the things that I would say of all of the symptoms or the the names in the ADHD um, diagnosis, so they have attention deficit disorder, and you know some of it's the inattentive, um, and then the hyperactivity. For me, they, they've added in impulsivity now mm. to the hyperactivity side. Impulsivity is one of my greatest challenges, yeah, same. And, <laughs> and I love it. I mean, it's great. I, I know where I want to go. I trust my intuition. Yeah, I I'm, trust my gut a lot, and I've realised now, even though I'm super impulsive actually it always works out so it's fine and I I worry less about being super impulsive because I know that I am um so but it makes you the fun friend right (laughs) it it does and sometimes you don't know why and you can't really explain so Mm. to take people on the journey Mm. and that's what I found interesting now that I've started taking medication it's like Uh, I feel sometimes like I can sit there and my brain is sorting out memories and Mm. information and moving it to the right department. And it just feels so unscrambled in some ways. Um, But getting that diagnosis was amazing because I remember walking down the street all the time and feeling like I was looking in people's eyes or looking at strangers Mm. and being like, what? What, what is the secret what is the answer yeah. <laughs> like wanting to do every course and meet yeah. every person and do things but it is really nice and to chat to you because I can feel both of us like fidgeting and I'm <laughs> trying not to move too much because I know I'm so super yeah, fidgety <laughs> yeah um but yeah and I think as well that that's a point about taking opportunities not being a yes person mm. to everything because no. you know you're really busy so saying no is important too but yeah. also the fact that yes you were in Newcastle you happen to be here for a few days but we literally met two or three weeks mm. ago at an event and then saw each other at Northern Power Women Awards and now you're here and it's three just, times <laughs> I know I'm, I feel so fortunate three times in, in one month in the yeah. space of a few weeks and I think it just goes to show as well Well, this is a question I have for you about role models and coaches and mentors and allies. So you talked about being in a space that does diversity and inclusion, but a lot of people working in diversity and inclusion are burnt out. Mm. It's emotional labor. It's exhausting. Mm. We just spoke about weight for different um, support systems Mm. for uh, neurodiversity, mental health diagnoses. Yeah. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on what organizations, corporates could do, what 
business leaders can do um, to better support their staff, actually, who may be going through anxiety or different challenges because if there is something that feels wrong and you're just being put on medication and it might be anxiety meds or something else but it's not necessarily the answer they almost kick in the can down the road Mm. so so it's almost like treating the root cause isn't it exactly what what do you find in your work is a huge challenge for businesses so I think mental health generally is a huge challenge because people don't know what to say and they'd rather not say anything than say the wrong thing but the reality is we all have mental health and some of us decline it's like I always say our mental health isn't linear and we have this roller coaster and certainly my my roller coaster is way more up and down than, than than others however you know you don't have to even have a diagnosed condition to empathize with someone you know someone might be stressed or you know they might have lost someone they might be grieving people have been affected by the pandemic in loads of different ways so what we're seeing now is almost like this silent epidemic behind the scenes of a decline in people's mental health and employers going what do we do how do we help people um so a couple of things that we found that uh, have worked, I suppose, in, in organisations is, first of all, storytelling. So like I tell my story about having a breakdown and how I kind of overcame that, um, we uh, founded a charity called This Is Me uh, up here in in, um, in Yorkshire, but there is, they're, they're all over the UK and it's a free campaign and it encourages organisation leaders to share their story and to lead by example, to break down the stigma rather than, I suppose, you know, the, it, in some organisations, you just have people from the bottom doing it, and then the, the, it kind of gets to here, and you, you need that leadership buy-in, and so if they can role model, like you were saying before, and share their story and be vulnerable, and show people that you know you can still be the CEO and have anxiety and ADHD. You can still, you know, do whatever you want to do. You just might. It might take you a bit longer you just might need some support so I think that's a really great starting point for businesses because it's a free thing that they can get involved in um, and there's loads of like information that you can download and create videos and all sorts of stuff that you know filming it or blogs and you just find the medium that works you know people some people won't feel comfortable doing it on a video because it's quite you know it's quite difficult for some people to talk about their mental health but then they might feel a release in writing it out so finding the way that works best for those people so they feel comfortable and I suppose just having a really open environment um, at Thrive that's what I wanted to create so in, in fact most people in their interviews are like so I'm having some yeah, I know you do and we talk about it like it's like I don't know I'm wearing green shoes like it's just a really normal conversation and I think that's really important because there's so much taboo and stigma around mental ill health and people feel that they're going to be judged or they'll not get that promotion or they won't get asked to come to that networking event oh because she's anxious she won't want to come and people make assumptions but the reality is a lot of employers are really supportive and they want to they want to help they just don't know how to so it's almost you know, the individuals having to be more open but also the employers actually creating an environment where they feel safe to do that and psychologically safe that's really really important so we talk a lot about creating psychologically safe workplaces and how you might do that through training through education and and through things like the the this is me campaign and I think it's really important that employers do something rather than nothing you know and it could simply be that they they one person shares their story this year that's better than nothing or you know get mental health first aid trainers or have some neurodiversity training something that just moves you along in terms of your awareness yeah, I think that's really powerful. Uh, absolutely investing in training, supporting your staff to be mm. able to have those conversations. Um, do you ever, in terms of psychological safety, do you ever worry about people triggering each other? So if people yeah. have got different anxieties or if they are so open, is that a challenge as well in terms of emotional vulnerability? I think so. And, and one of the one of the things that we put in place is peer to peer support groups for those people who say um, in an organisation, you have a ser- like loads of mental health first aiders. So they will be the go to person if someone's feeling particularly whether they're in crisis or just particularly low and that those people need supporting. And we always talk about the importance of making sure that they're supported because they're doing it voluntary alongside their job. You know, it's not an actual it's not a job to be the mental health first aider. It's, it's a role within a role. And so you know often what you find is those people already have lived experience and they are more vulnerable and that's why they volunteer because they care you know that's exactly why I do it and and you can empathize but often you can take on too much so it's understanding boundaries and also educating the team on what is and isn't okay to share at work obviously 
you want to encourage people to be really open but there's an element of you know we, ca- we can't be therapists we that the, there's a line and there's a role of uh, you know the employer the mental health first aiders and I think it's really important to communicate what those boundaries are and we do that through training through once people have become mental health first aiders the communication that goes out to the team and then a session explaining the role of that person and and you know how how they can help ideally they would sign posts to help you know obviously they can actively listen but they're not there to give advice or to coach or to train or any or you know to definitely not to therapize as well so yeah I think boundaries is super important and and you know being clear as well if someone's telling you something is making you feel uncomfortable um you know obviously you can listen to them but making sure you protect yourself and I think that's really really important especially when you've got your own mental health issues that you're dealing with absolutely uh I think one of the things I like that I know about you and that you've shared is about the your non-negotiables. Mm. So you have, for instance, you love the gym and you get up early, but yeah. then you go to the gym during the day yeah. when it's quieter, yeah. but that's a great time for you and it's part of your routine. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, routine's super important, I think. Well, certainly for me, I get, like as you say, 5am club. Um, in fact, one of my friends messaged me this morning saying, I joined 6am club, I'm nearly there. And it's really nice because when people get up early, they message me because they know that that's what I do. But that allows me to have a couple of hours of non-distracting time where there's no emails, there's no notifications. Um, and obviously you can turn your emails and things off, but the reality is when you're running a business, you have them all on you know so having that time is really important and then going to the gym when it's quieter again gives me the headspace and it that's my therapy I love it and and getting outside with the dogs being outside and you know exercising for me has just been incredibly important for my recovery from a breakdown but also maintaining my self-care and I think more so than ever since the lockdown because that routine changed because of the way way we worked Um, and you know I was spending loads of time in person with people and then I was behind a screen for 12 hours a day or 15 18 hours a day during the pandemic and that was really difficult because I'm such a people person and I like to be around energy and people so going from public speaking doing podcasts being on tv and in in court to just being behind a screen every single day I was like I just wanted to get outside. It was awful. I don't know how you found it. Pretty much the yeah. same. I was doing a, a master's in business admin, so an MBA at the time, and wow. I was interacting with at least 400 people every day at uni and being on uh, different networking, doing mm. my podcast as well at the time. And I remember when the lockdown happened, just the crash that I had. Um, I was so lonely and just mm. so sad. And just th- I would... Um, try and um, go to classes but I I just would fall asleep because I just found them so draining being online all day it's so hard and I was actually teaching as well I teach part-time on uh, the law degree and the LPC it's like baby solicitors Um, and that class was three hours on a Monday night from five till eight on a on a like a zoom and nobody put their camera on and I was like this is uh, so exhausting. Uh, and when you thrive on energy and yeah. you're getting no facial expressions or yeah. feedback, that must be it really was challenging. really, really, really difficult. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I think there's been some amazing lessons from the lockdowns in terms of flexible working and, and accessibility to, you know, great talent and clients are all over the country, all over the world, actually through zoom and things like that that's been amazing but i think it's it also important to have human interaction and that really showed me how much i thrive off being around people um and actually you know through the whole uh, all my diagnosis was all through that time as well so that was a challenge because i was adjusting to like medication and um, trying to survive my business <laughs> and get my um, and also working out what was going on with furlough and all of that stuff because we were the ones translating it and you know pretty much in the news every other day thinking oh god how do we translate late what Boris is saying because he doesn't even know what's going on <laughs> so it was a, it was a challenge but now it's good it's good to find that balance and, and set almost a, n- a new routine so I still have that morning piece and on, on an evening I still have my kind of shut off piece because you don't have the commute to work every day that used to be my downtime I put a podcast on or something uh, just to kind of switch my brain I don't know if you get that like I have to switch my brain off otherwise it doesn't it just stays on constantly <laughs> Um, I'm still working out the switch in the brain yeah, off, but I do. I like to walk. I find yeah. that really therapeutic, and I just try and stay away from shops, anything yeah. where I can spend money because shiny things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a backpack. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but um, I do quite like that about the ADHD thing is, you know, seeing people who are as flamboyant or have interest in fashion or colours or just brightness. Mm. And I love that um, blur between creativity and art and yeah. madness. You know, some of the greatest minds were yeah. mad as we might have thought, yeah. you know, but actually it's neurodivergence and yeah. it's all a spectrum and it's beautiful. Um, I love hearing about your routine. I, um I'm not really a routine person, but it's something that I've always wanted to learn how to do. For mm -hmm. me, it's not knowing the steps. I'm like, how do you do that every day? Yeah. Like, it just feels hard to me. But um, I, I think actually, if I was when I was a kid, if I'd had the steps, if I knew what done looked like, yeah. that would have helped a lot. I think one of the, well, certainly one of the things my psychiatrist said to me was the reason you probably haven't been diagnosed is you've put all of the things that an ADHD coach or, or you know, therapy would have put in place for you. You've done it yourself. So, you know, putting the routine in, working outside of work time to do the extra, like all the bits that you'd, I just thought was normal. It's like, that's not normal. Like, you know, that's fine. It's not normal. But also made me realise that I was all, always overcompensating to kind of just keep up with everybody. And that's really exhausting. That's so exhausting because, you know, you're getting up at five and then in the evening, it takes me ages to wind down. I have to like get off a screen like at least two hours before bed. Otherwise, I can't go to sleep. My brain's just like on. And so that's why the routine for me quite early on, I realised helped. Um, but it took, it wasn't, I've not always had the 5am routine. I think I've really solidified it in the past like three years, but it's more since I set my business up because I was thinking you know I have to get these things I, 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 this cannot fail and and yeah I suppose it was I'm still learning and there's some days I don't get up at that time today was one of those <laughs> um but also just being kind to yourself when you don't I think that's really important I used to absolutely beat myself up if I didn't do exactly what I planned to do and that would then become very exhausting as well so it's it's a balance and just being kind to yourself because I think we're our own worst enemies and the way we speak to ourselves is not how we'd speak to others and I, that's a message that I always give to myself would you say that to someone else no well don't say it to yourself <laughs> I love it. So you spoke a lot about determination. This cannot fail. Mm -hmm. Your business cannot fail. And I want to know, um, you know, for anyone listening, anyone watching who's looking at you and going, wow, she's had all these challenges, but she's also running a law th firm called Thrive. Mm -hmm. So you've actually declared that over yourself and your life and your business. How did you get through that gap? from being in a corporate job mm -hmm. at this time you were undiagnosed with ADHD mm -hmm. having all these challenges having anxiety yet you still started your own firm somehow found that grit mm -hmm. and dogged determination <laughs> exactly well we work hard in the north I mean I'm a adopted uh, adopted northern girl but you know I think um yeah we do we work hard and people have got really good work ethic um and one of the things you know how did you get from there to thriving yeah, and then literally. finding out the ADHD and stuff I mean what were the how did you find that in yourself um good question actually um I, I often say I just winged it <laughs> if I'm really honest I have no idea and the reality is I just take kind of each day as it comes and I take opportunities and I take a lesson from everything rather than beating myself up about something that didn't go right. I'm thinking, what can I learn from that? And I think that, that it's that mindset that's really helped me get through because there's a lot of things that haven't gone right. And if I focused on those, then I wouldn't be where I am. So I think the mindset of just constantly seeking out the opportunities and the lessons and how can I grow? And I'm, I'm obsessed with like learning and reading and just constantly learning not just about myself but about different areas like neuro neurodiversity is a, a big area that I'm interested in and read a lot of like psychological papers and things like that and for me I think gr making sure that I'm in a growth mindset all the time has been really helpful um, I'm never resting on my laurels thinking right I've done this that's it I'm done I'm always thinking what's next what's next um, and that and that, I suppose it's the energy like always wanting to do all the projects but which I suppose ADHD has probably helped with because it's given me so much energy and because I'm quite impulsive that's quite rare for lawyers lawyers are very risk averse obviously that's what we do um but I'm also really creative because of the ADHD, I think is probably why. And actually, I did, actually did French and art and psychology at A-level, not history and English and law. So I'm, I'm actually a really creative person and, and having my own business allowed me to be creative and do the marketing and, you know, wear what I want and, and just express myself. And I think 
putting, I suppose, cr- creating that environment for myself has allowed me to use my skills rather than in a traditional law firm. I'd just be doing law every day, which is great. You know, I, lo- I love the law, but there's, I feel like there's way more to life than just doing that bit. And they, I suppose it was almost like my wings were clipped a little bit in that corporate world. Um, so this, yeah, this growth mindset helps me to kind of keep pushing and, and, and learning. It's almost like, um, for me, you've made law come alive. So, you know, you've made us realise and see that our lawyers, our accountants, they're people yeah. who like music yeah. and they have yeah. favourite recipes red lipstick. <laughs> and they wear red lipstick and they, they like to go skiing yeah. and they like to do this and, they, you know, they're fun, you yeah. know, and um, it's given a bit of a, a different perspective on things. But you spoke about um, being really interested in learning and continuing mm. to learn. It made me think of a conversation I had with my dad the other day. He was like, you've finished your MBA now you've got two degrees <laughs> like what, what, what well well he wants me to have babies that's a different story <laughs> um but it's it's like I thought you were done with learning and I'm like because I'm doing um my neurolinguistic programming NLP coaching Ooh. and um hypnotherapy at the moment and I love it I'm learning so much even about the language I use with myself mm. and it's been a fascinating journey but but he was like, I thought you were done with studying, please. And I'm like, I hope I'm never done. I yeah. hope I'm learning till I die, honestly. Yeah. I say that. I think it's important that I always try to learn something every single day. And I think it's really important, especially as you get to a more senior level. You know, people often stop. And that's what that's that's the hugest mistake you could ever make. Learning is so important. Nobody knows everything. There's always more that you can learn. And I think it's yeah, I think it's quite arrogant when people just stop actually and go, no, I know this now. I'm the CEO, and um, you know, it, I think for me, it makes makes it makes people better leaders as well. You're more compassionate and empathetic because you're constantly learning about yourself and others. Whereas, you know, there's lots of organisations where they adopt more of kind of a dictatorship and you're authoritarian. You'll just do this because I'm the boss. But actually, if you listen to people and you're learning all the time, you you grow and they grow with you. It's almost like that that concept of you lift while you're um, you lift others while you're rising, and I, I love that idea. That's something I spot a lot with women in leadership. Mm. Is we do tend to throw the ladder down and help people up. Mm. And what I've noticed a lot as well is there was a tendency in the past, maybe in the 80s, 90s, for women to be very masculine in their behavior. And that doesn't mean you can't be direct or have different Mm. traits. Be assertive, but you don't have to be aggressive and masculine. Exactly. And I think there's a a new way of leadership, empathetic leadership. Mm. And it's really exciting to be a female leader at the moment and watching this happen. At the same time, I'm also curious about your thoughts on leadership. So from my point of view, with the pandemic, people are more than ever distrustful of the government, Mm. of their uh, businesses and organisations, of corporates. And I'm curious about, you know, you work in employment law. (laughs) What are the, the bits of advice you might give to leaders now? about how they can actually really retain their staff mm. or even reclaim their trust because there's a lot of trust issues isn't there yeah yeah well i think i think there's a the the point about the type of leadership and um you know we obviously i'm biased because i think that you know creating a psychologically safe workplace is is the most important thing you can do in a workplace but when you look at the research it shows that people are not now just looking at how much am i paid they're looking at what values does the company have what do what do they do about diversity and inclusion and and does that reflect in reality what they're putting on their website is that authentic or is it tokenistic and the worst thing that companies could do is be tokenistic when it comes to well-being or diversity and inclusion because that's where we're seeing lots of people leave organisations because they've got poster boys and girls that <clears throat> make them look like they're representative of an inclusive firm or company or, or, or whatever they might be. And, and the reality is when they get there, that it isn't, that's not how it is. And so, you know, investing in this, it's not a nice to have. It's, it's, it's absolutely imperative that we focus on truly creating a diverse and and inclusive because often what we have is a diverse workforce but it's not inclusive and the diff people don't often get the difference you know diversity is great but if those people don't feel that they belong then what's like that's not an inclusive workplace and so that's where it often falls down and people are leaving workplaces for less money to have more flexibility to have an environment where they can be their true self and also to you know spend more time with families and things I think people have realized that in the lockdown going 
actually, I don't want to do four hour commutes every day. You know, actually, I quite like walking the dog in the morning and taking my kids to school and whatever it might, whatever their new new normal is. And so we're seeing now a lot, especially in employment context, a lot of flexible working requests. And traditionally, most companies would say, no, it doesn't work for the business. And there's a number of different ways that they can refuse it. But I think they'll struggle. You know, we've seen a lot of cases recently, six figure cases where it, you know, people literally just asking for a four day week and they're not asking to be paid for five days just to work four days because they can't get childcare for the fifth day or whatever it might be. And then that becomes a claim and the employer, and it doesn't need to be that way. I think if we, we just need to be more collaborative and more inclusive when it comes to the way we work and also the culture that we're creating. So culture, again, it, it, the diversity and inclusion piece, I think, falls hand in hand with culture and all of that is is really important but I think before the pandemic that was definitely an afterthought for many businesses if it was ever a thought um, whereas now we do a lot of work on um, diversity inclusion and culture as well so um, one of the things obviously we're a law firm but we we look after people because people matter so that's our focus is not just on telling you what the law is it's okay strategically what does that now mean how does this impact on your culture do you need training this so so that piece we're seeing loads of companies come to us and some of the like biggest law firms in the world saying to me can you um tell us how you did this and and you know working with our regulatory body to create a framework um, working with the international bar association as well to help them create it globally so that what we've got is almost like a a framework that people can implement because people don't know where to start when it comes to culture um and so they just don't do anything same with the mental health stuff but actually it takes a long time so it's making those small changes and showing people that you do care then they're less likely to leave yeah I think those are really valid points and just uh, I worked in in higher education so one of the things that I'm most excited about since the pandemic is actually seeing um, old institutions across the globe shaken up by new technology mm. and for the you know a real rush to kind of do things differently deliver online teaching in a different mm. way and I'm so excited for it I think there's so much more to life so much than more opportunity isn't mm-hmm. there yeah and there is certainly a place and a value for the pomp and ceremony that goes with beautiful graduations and mm. gowns and robes but people are doing things in a different way mm. now um and you know I I think that's really empowering actually is letting people choose for themselves mm. that there, there are other routes than just going to university yeah definitely so someone who really inspires me uh you may have heard of her is called ellie middleton so Mm -hmm. she is all over um linkedin at the moment but she has recently been diagnosed with adhd and autism Mm -hmm. and she shared a post this week because it's neurodiversity week Mm -hmm. and uh celebrating neurodiversity Mm -hmm. week i think yeah awareness awareness (laughs) that's the one um and she'd said she'd had offers from over five universities top institutions for maths to study maths at uni and she turned them down and she went to work at the post office and everyone was like what are you doing and she was there for five years and she has autism and she liked the routine of going in Mm. and doing things in a certain way day after day like the process exactly Mm. and um but now you know uh, a few months ago she was working in uh, i think as a marketing assistant or um an entry-level role in any case And within a couple of months, since having her diagnosis and sharing it and just being herself a bit Mm. more, um, she's almost uh, turned professionalism on its head, Mm. speaking all over the, you know, the globe and online. And I think seeing young role models as well, I think she's 23. I I find it really really inspiring. And it's things like that where you can think, well, what, what opportunities do I have that I can give or open yeah. doors and it's about opening up the net and and the I ladders felt like that on monday with the northern power women awards and hearing some of the things that people had done i was just like wow this is it was the most empowering event just to have everybody celebrating everybody it wasn't about who won it wasn't about um you know just having the winners on the screen it was every single person was celebrated and i thought that was amazing to see how young some of those people were i mean there was a girl that was 21 that built a school in ghana or something i was like wow this is just incredible to see young people actually just stepping up stepping up as well and doing that and and like you say becoming role models in their own right from that 
I think young people get a, a bad rap, actually. Yeah, I do. And it, it worries me. And uh, another thing that I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, so we've we've spoken a lot about bias today or just generally across, you know, it's a, um, a huge topic at the moment on panels, um, mm-hmm. on TV. Uh, it was the theme of International Women's mm-hmm. uh, Day this, this, well, it feels like week and month yeah. um, <laughs> this year. But um, one of the big themes is bias. And you've spoken about bias today in being a barrister, mm-hmm mental health bias and um, being uh, biased from a gender point of view mm-hmm. but uh, I am also really concerned about the bias we have a- around men as well mm-hmm. so I wanted to get your thoughts on um, male suicide I mean I read the other day that a, a male commits suicide every two hours yeah it's the biggest killer of men under 45 and it's it's something that I do a lot of public speaking on this on this topic because I actually lost a friend about Oh, it was about eight years ago to suicide and and we've lost family members as well so it's something and they're all men mm. and it's something that we find men just don't talk as openly about their mental health as women do it's not every man uh, every, every man should I say but there are amazing charities like Andy's Man's Club I don't know if you've come across them oh my god they're just saving lives uh, Luke Ambler um, who, who who founded it he, he lost his uh, brother-in-law to suicide and that was Andy and they've set this group up and now they won the Queen's Award uh, for their charity and they have got groups all across the UK it's free to go I think it's a Wednesday night and it's facilitated by people who have been you know guests before just and they just sit and chat and they just it's very very informal but the idea is is that they've got a safe place to talk and it's not counseling it's not coaching it's just literally a group of men just talking and that's that sounds so simple but it saves lives um so yeah it's a, it's a huge problem at the moment um and actually did you know that the word committed is um, this is uh, something that I always talk about. So the word committed is actually because it used to be illegal to, it used to be a criminal offence to kill yourself. And uh, I think it was in the 90s maybe that was decriminalised. So now how people describe it rather than saying committed suicide we say took their own life or died by suicide so I didn't know this until I did some mental health first aid training I learned it and I just thought it was an amazing thing to to just understand like the language that we use when we talk about suicide it's a, it's a really important point about language and um and it's something, it really does worry me because I, I see so many great groups. Like the one, I'm going to definitely check that one out. Yeah. There's one I, I've been following called Black Men Walking. Yes, I've So they, that. they yeah. go in and they go on walks, walks outdoors and it's about just um, having a safe space mm-hmm. and being able to explore your mental health but also discuss things like race and you know any different challenges that they're Cultural particularly going well. through. Yeah. But I, I do feel, that, you know, it's so important we having all of these diversity, uh, equality, inclusion conversations um, across all levels of leadership. But there's also conversations that there's people who aren't always included. So we we, we don't always have um, races included or, or different faiths or mm. or different abilities. But also um, what is becoming more um, of an issue now or, or what I'm seeing a lot is um, some of the trans community don't mm. always get their voices heard. And so... Um, I do think having safe spaces that you can go to whatever your faith or background or ability mm-hmm. is so important. But it does worry me the the kind of, um, I, I think, uh, there there is a lot of um, anti-men sentiment out there that, that concerns me and I think adds to, to some yeah. of this stuff. It does, and I think because of the Me Too campaign and all of that stuff as well, it's really positive for women, but it doesn't mean that all men discriminate. And I think, I, I mean, I'm certainly very lucky to be surrounded by amazing men in my company. And, you know, we have great allies. I think I think you might have met one of our, our team at the event. And, and, you know, surrounding yourself with male allies, I think is really important. And men play a huge role in, you know, empowering women, actually. And I think it's really important to to shine a light on that because it's not just female role models we need. We need male allies to, you know, open those doors or, you know, lift whilst they rise as well as women. Uh, because as we know, there are more men in leadership roles than women. So men play a huge role in that. Um, and I think often they get a bit of a bad rep and that's not really fair. You know, obviously there is discrimination that happens and that's they are isolated incidents. But generally, I found that men have been you know, quite supportive in, in my circle. In fact, my one of my mentors is, is a man and he's the CEO of another law firm and he and he helps me. And I, I think it's 
you know, it's really amazing to have people like that around around you when you're growing, not just working in silo with just people who are like you. I think that's one of the most important things that I've uh, that I've heard you say there is about not surrounding yourself with people who are like you. Mm. I, that's bias in itself, it unconscious is. bias. Yeah. yeah, so I found at one point I was surrounding myself with very liberally minded people, very inclusionary focused people. And I, I realized I was never seeing a different perspective. Mm. And it's not necessarily that I always want to see everyone's perspective, but sometimes it's helpful, yeah. you know, and, and sometimes we can go too far on one way or another, mm. right wing or left wing. Yeah. And it, it's quite, it's quite, um, challenging sometimes to kind of work out what your values are when you're surrounding yourself with the same yeah. sound like, almost like an echo chamber it and is. that's what you don't yeah. want and it's something that we've encouraged at thrive is to everybody has an equal voice and so when we do meetings rather than me lead and ask you know or for example i'll give it a, I don't know an example of some initiatives that we want to run rather than me doing that we ask the team to do it first anonymously mm-hmm. so everybody has a voice and then we vote on that and nobody knows who's put Uh, each idea in and then from there we then discuss it and then they lead it so rather than because there's an unconscious bias of following your leader as well and if I make a suggestion the reality is people even though they have a different opinion might not say it so again that diversity of thought is really important as leaders that we encourage people to think laterally and be confident to express their own opinions and you know don't just follow what everybody else is saying just because you don't have the confidence to speak up so I suppose like creating those environments is really important but I think for me it's also meant that I know my staff will challenge me now and we ask them and they hate this bit because every month we have these one-to-ones and we start by asking about well-being workload so it's a very well-being focused one-to-one which is quite unusual for a law firm but at the end they have to give me feedback every single month and they have to and I think when they first started doing it they're like oh feedback is positive and I was like no it can be negative and I'm not going to be angry and I think that again being open to you know hearing what people think how we could do things better how how I could communicate better that again goes back to the point we were saying at the beginning about growth about learning and you can learn from those people that you spend all day with you know and and actually the different opinions that they might have can influence me and they can help me grow as well as themselves so yeah having I suppose having the courage to accept that as well I think that's really important because some people don't want to hear it because they'd rather be in an echo chamber because that's easier Um, but I always think you you don't grow from a place of comfort you've got to feel a little bit uncomfortable and then you know you're growing I absolutely agree but there is a question I have for you now um, which is actually you know you you mentioned you already were doing public speaking Mm -hmm. and media stuff before the pandemic your life's even more different now because you've got this mind changing (laughs) or life changing um knowledge about yourself in that you know about ADHD Mm. your your business has survived and is thriving literally (laughs) (laughs) so I would like to know because I work with a lot of women particularly who worry about their confidence their voice Mm. they worry about sharing their voice they would be terrified of being on a podcast and so they get opportunities and then they'll say to me can you work with me can you help me and so I I, I will but for for you doing all of that media work Mm -hmm. going on you know Steph's Pack Lunch Mm -hmm. with Steph McGovern and being on different um, other media outlets is there anything that you find helps you to get into kind of the zone to do those opportunities? Or um, I know you're not shy, but for mm. anyone who is shy, any tips? Do you know what though? I do. I do have anxiety, so um, I actually, I actually, obviously, I trained as a barrister. So for anyone that doesn't know what a barrister is, it's an advocate in court, and and, and part of that is you learn how to speak publicly. So obviously, I've had that training, but that was a long time ago. Um, but I haven't really. I haven't really had any like public speaking training I'm just quite authentic and I just go with it and I think sometimes we overthink things certainly I do um and and just not overthinking it I mean on Steph's Pat Lunch I actually had to have a script which is the first time I've ever had to do that normally I just wing it and I had to rehearse 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 and actually she took the script off me and she said right just try it without it because I, I can see that you know this but you're trying to almost look at the like it's, it's like it's like you're doubting yourself So let's take that away and just do it. And I got everything right. So it's sometimes overthinking it and over scripting it can make it worse. So 
obviously knowing the questions in advance can be helpful but some of the stuff I do I, I don't get that um thinking being able to think on your feet as well um just knowing your topic obviously I speak about employment law because that's I'm an expert in that area if I have to speak about something outside of that area is making sure I've done all my research and I feel comfortable um or if it's like a new piece of law that I know potentially what all the questions could be um so preparation is key but there's one thing that I do which I um I do when I'm public speaking and I'll go to the toilet and put my hands on my hips and it's like a power pose and I do a bit of breath work before because uh, people can probably see I speak very fast <laughs> so to calm me down and to slow me down to slow my heart rate down um, I do a bit of breath work before and just breathe because that's something we we forget to do consciously absolutely and I think that's with anyone with anxiety but also when you have ADHD it's like you forget to breathe you literally forget to breathe sometimes <laughs> and sometimes I forget to stop talking as well <laughs> well speaking of talking I know we, we are I could chat to you all day but I am conscious of time so there's two last questions I yeah. have for you the first one is what are you most excited about in law is there anything that's really kind of like any cases going on at the moment or um, anything in diversity and inclusion or anything you'd like to share that really excites you about changes or opportunities or challenges that are going on? So I think the the concept of flexible working and the reality of the changes that might come in around that. So I, I'm on the Law Society Committee, so I've been able to consult on some of the changes that are coming in. We've got the new Employment Law Bill, which I don't know when it's coming in, but there'll be some changes coming. We don't know what they are yet, but that'll be, I think, quite exciting from a very geeky employment lawyer's perspective. Um, but what I mean by the flexible working changes is at the moment you have to be employed for, two, uh, for 26 weeks before you're able to make a flexible working request under, under the law. So the idea is that would be a day one right, which I think makes sense why would you work five days a week if you could only work four for the first six months so that's really exciting because that's progressive um there's also I'm campaigning at the moment to change the law uh, to require businesses to conduct mental health and well-being risk assessments so that will allow businesses to identify if people are suicidal it, what support they might need to put in place if it's if it's work causing it or home so that they can invest in mental health and well-being in the right areas rather than just giving free fruit on a Friday and you know having I don't know yoga which I by the way I love yoga I'm not dissing yoga but that isn't always going to fit. It's not going to fix the problem. So allowing this more data driven approach. So we're uh, we're working with some MPs to hopefully now the coronavirus stuff is calming down. I can get back on it with the with the MPs that we've got the support. And I've got a meeting with the mayor of West Yorkshire as well, which is really exciting. So, yeah, there's there's lots of really good things happening in, in our space, actually, at the moment. And I think we're going to see more employers investing in diversity and inclusion. We're, we're already seeing that, but we're going to start to see more best practice, I think, which will be really well positive for everybody, but also creating those psychologically safe places for people to thrive. Perfect. Okay. And the last question I have, which I love to ask everyone. Um, so Nurture Your Zest, my show, is about overcoming adversity. Mm -hmm. So we all have prickly situations in life. Um, and it's how through courage, uh, creativity and curiosity, we can find inspiration to nurture your zest. Mm -hmm. So or nurture our zest. And I know you've talked about some of the ways that you do that. So you do that through sports, mm -hmm. gym, fun, all these different things. But what if you could choose one word, what would be your one word to nurture your zest? Mm, sleep. I don't know about you, but for me, that is an absolute rarity. It's yeah. a gift when I have an uninterrupted good sleep. Good night's sleep. I've learned so much about sleep recently and I think because my brain my brain is so important my brain is my life because of obviously that's my job is everything's in my brain but also my brain is really unique and I do need to ch recharge it more than others and getting the right amount of sleep and good quality sleep is so important and I think that for me is if everybody can do that everybody can work out what you know what type of sleep that they have and see the benefits from that. So I'm being very selfish now, but just because I don't sleep and I would love to sleep and I know I have PTSD as well, which is hard with yeah. sleep, but I would love to know, just in case anyone else would as well, <laughs> any tips then that you've learned from your research on sleep? Well, actually, so I used to have insomnia and with um, with PTSD, uh, it, I get a lot of um, night terrors and um, what's it called? Flashbacks? Yeah, and it just, it's that sleep paralysis, there we go. And so I've had to really think about how my 
sleep I call it sleep hygiene so your, your sleep hygiene so what you do before you go to bed um, I always like to get a bath on a night time and read a book in the bath and completely switch off that's kind of my switch off uh, especially when I'm working from home because otherwise you literally sat at your computer and then you go to bed um, I don't really watch tv um, I listen to podcasts and read more and I never used to read actually it's my only because I'm on the medication for my ADHD I can actually read a book now <laughs> which is great um, but you know journaling has also really helped me I'm actually creating my own journal at the moment um but the idea of just getting stuff out of my head before I go to bed um and just slowing down that's it's really important and I find that I don't always do that as well so uh, I'm saying that you know these are things that help but it also don't be hard on yourself if you don't do it every every single day you know as a strict routine but just think about what what helps you sleep other people they hate getting a bath so that's not going to help them but find out your routine that helps you kind of calm down before bed I love that and no screens. No screens. Yeah, no screens for yeah. bed for at least an hour. That is my feeling. But I, I love <laughs> distractions. I'm like, oh, ping. Yeah. <laughs> I love gratitude journaling. That yes. is my favorite. I, I like to go to bed. Um, actually, Being grateful. Yeah, yeah, saying everything I'm grateful for and actually praying. Mm. Um, you know, whatever higher power you may or may not believe in. I think um, just being grateful for the things that have come into your life, mm. even the hard things that are challenges to learn mm. from, but being able to say good wishes on other people and Absolutely. stuff that people or yourself are going through. I find prayer really, really important, but that's so cool. Okay, right. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time and for being here. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Nurture Your Zest. You can find us online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Nurture Your Zest. If you've liked today, please subscribe. You can also leave us a review if you're feeling extra kind. Today's podcast has been made available through the kind sponsorship of Nat Branding Company. We look forward to catching up with you again soon as you learn to nurture your zest.